Ephesians chapter 6. This is not intentional on my part, but it seems like at least once a year, the Lord directs my heart to this passage in Ephesians chapter 6. So this is probably, since we have been here in Montana, this is probably at least the fourth message that I have delivered from this passage of scripture. And again, it's, it's not that I volitionally determined to do this. It's, the Lord just keeps drawing me back again and again to this passage of scripture. Ephesians chapter 6 and we go, we're going to start with verse 10 and we're going to go down through verse 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all things, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the word of the spirit excuse me and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god look at verse 12 we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. It, it, are we comfortable in here, temperature-wise? Okay. You've heard me say this before, and I want to say it again in introduction. Our battle is first and foremost a spiritual battle. More than a political battle, it is a spiritual battle. If we don't understand that, we're going to be like a dog chasing its tail. We're never going to get to where we think we need to go. The political problems, along with all the other problems that stem from that, are symptoms, not the cause. The cause is a spiritual warfare is taking place. We have a spiritual enemy who is powerful, well-organized, who has mighty armies at his disposal who is capable of inflicting great damage to not only the people of the world, but the church itself. I want to talk to you today about the satanic conspiracy. There are a lot of great men and women in the patriot movement who A, do not understand that there is a conspiracy at all. They think that these events are all spontaneous and unrelated. They do not recognize a design behind the events at all. I would venture to say the vast, vast majority of the people in our country and the people in our churches are totally ignorant of any sort of conspiracy. They don't understand it. And whenever someone 
begins to talk about it, they're immediately poo-hooed as uh, conspiracy nuts and things of that nature. The media does an excellent job of marginalizing people that it wants to marginalize. Outstanding job. But people in the church as well. And this is what kind of confuses me and bothers me a, a, a little bit. I understand perhaps if unsaved, unredeemed people have a hard time understanding a conspiracy. I don't understand Christian men and especially pastors not understanding the spiritual conspiracy that we are fighting. Honestly and truly, I don't get it. How can they not understand this? If they believe in God, and they do, they also believe in Satan. If there's a heaven, there's a hell. If there's good, there's evil. If there's wickedness, there's righteousness. Preachers get up every day and talk about, in one way or another, well, not, I guess, I'm thinking back in the old days when preachers taught the Bible. I got to keep remembering that they're not teaching the Bible anymore. They used to get up and teach about Satan and, and the battle that we face with him in the spiritual world. Well, if they really believe that, how can they overlook Ephesians 6.12 and not compre or not comprehend what it's saying if they don't overlook it? How can they miss this? This is as clear as any verse could possibly be. We are fighting a spiritual war, a spiritual enemy. Now, I'm going to open with, with just two commentaries from two of my favorite 19th century Bible theologians. I'll start with Albert Barnes, and then I'll finish with John Gill. And they're just a little bit lengthy, so bear with me as I read their comments on verse 12. Please try to follow along. I know it's difficult when I read. The mind has a tendency to, to get lazy and, and not maybe follow. But if you can, force your mind to, to follow what they're saying. Because, again, these men wrote a long time ago. And sometimes they write in a style that we're not always the most familiar with. But I want you to hear what both these men say about Ephesians 6.12. I've digested, I, I didn't take the entire commentary, I digested their comments into, uh, into what I'm going to give you. The Greek, the wrestling to us, or there is not to us a wrestling with flesh and blood. There is undoubtedly here an allusion to the ancient games of Greece, a part of the exercises in which consisted wrestling. And then a struggle, fight, combat. Here it refers to the struggle of, or combat which the Christian has to maintain, the Christian warfare, not against flesh and blood. The apostle does not mean to say that Christians had no enemies among men that opposed them, for they were exposed often to fiery persecution, nor that they had nothing to contend with in the carnal and corrupt propensities of their own nature which was true of them then as it is now, but that their main controversy, did you hear that? Their main controversy was with the invisible spirits of wickedness that sought to destroy them. They were the source and origin of all their spiritual conflicts, and with them the warfare was to be maintained against principalities, there can be no doubt whatsoever that the apostle alludes here to evil spirits. Like good angels, they were regarded as divided into ranks and orders and were supposed to be under the control of one mighty leader. 
It is probable that the allusion here is to the ranks and orders which they sustained before their fall, something like which they might still retain. The word principalities refers to principal rulers or chieftains. In other words, there is an army with rank and order and authority. There are generals and colonels and majors and captains and lieutenants and sergeants. It is a well-organized army Satan has at his disposal. Powers. Those who had power or to whom the name powers was given. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The rulers that preside over the regions of ignorance and sin with which the earth abounds. Darkness is an emblem of ignorance, misery, and sin. And no description could be more accurate than that of representing these malignant spirits as ruling over a dark world. The earth, dark and wretched and ignorant and sinful, is just such a dominion as they would choose or as they would cause. And the degradation and woe of the pagan world are just such as foul and malignant spirits would delight in. It is a wide and powerful empire. It has been consolidated by ages. It is sustained by all the authority of law. It is sustained by all of the authority of law. I'm pausing for effect. By all the omnipotence of the perverted religious principle. It's maintained by the perversion of religious principle. The devil's empire is maintained by law. The devil's empire is maintained by the perversion of religious teaching. By all the reverence for antiquity. By all the power of selfish, corrupt, and base passions. No empire has been so extended or has continued so long as that empire of darkness. And nothing on earth is so difficult to destroy. Yet, the apostle says that it was on that kingdom they are to make war. Against that, the kingdom of the Redeemer was to be set up. And that was to be, and that was to be overcome by the spiritual weapons which he specifies. When he speaks of the Christian warfare here, he refers to the contest with the powers of this dark kingdom. He regards each and every Christian as a soldier to wage war on it in whatever way he could and wherever he could attack it. In whatever way he could and whatever he could attack it, it is our job as the Christian soldier to attack this stronghold of Satan. That's what he's saying. The contest, therefore, was not primarily with people or with the internal corrupt propensities of the soul. He said, it's it's not even, it's not the people and it's not even your own soul. It was with this vast and dark kingdom that had been set up over mankind. I do not regard this passage, therefore, as having a primary reference to the struggle which a Christian maintains with his own corrupt propensities. Oh, I wish I had time to elaborate on that. No, I don't have time. Most most pastors, when they come to this passage, that's all they deal with. That's all they deal with. The personal spiritual conflict of the heart and soul that we face as sinners saved by grace. That's all they deal with. That's all of it. Barnes says, I do not regard this passage, therefore, as having a primary reference to the struggle which a Christian maintains in his own corrupt propensity. That's not the main purpose of this passage. It's not dealing primarily with your personal contest with Satan. 
It's not dealing primarily with whatever the sins are in your own heart that the devil may choose to take advantage of. That's not the primary meaning of this particular passage. It is a warfare on a large scale with the entire kingdom of darkness over the world. The battle with Satan entails far more than the little bitty part that you're dealing with on a daily basis in your personal life. It's more than that. But we are so self-absorbed as Christians today. It's all about our fight. It's all about our struggle. It's all about what Satan is doing to us. How many times do your Christians get up and give testimony and talk about how Satan did this, the devil did this, the devil was attacking me, the devil... Hey, wait a minute. What about the attack that the devil is inflicting upon the entire world? What about the attacks against our government? What about the attacks against our country? What about the attacks against our state? What about the attacks against our community? What about the attacks against our city? in our municipality? What about the attacks against our church? No, it's all focused on me. Me, 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 me. We can't see beyond our own problems. This verse tells us of a universal campaign of evil. The, one, the Christian is to be cognizant of this universal conflict. He's to be aware of it. He's to be an active soldier against it. Not only must we fight whatever the personal battles that we have with the devil are on a personal level, we must also be able and willing and sagacious enough to be able as a soldier of Christ to fight the greater battle for the greater good. You never hear this. You never hear this from the pulpits regarding Ephesians 6.12. They don't read these old commentators. They read these new guys. That give them nothing but fluff. It is warfare on a large scale with the entire kingdom of darkness over the world. Yet in maintaining the warfare, the struggle will be with such portions of that kingdom as we come in contact with against spiritual wickedness or wicked spirits, literally, the spiritual things of wickedness. The allusion is undoubtedly to evil spirits and to their influences on earth. In high places, he writes, the lower heavens, the sky, the air, represented as the seat of evil spirits, the air is the seat, the authority, the place of evil spirits. That was Albert Barnes. Here's what John Gill writes, not quite as long. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is a reason why saints should be strong in the Lord and why they should put on the whole armor of God and prepare for battle since their enemies are such as here described. Not flesh and blood, not merely frail mortal men such as were wrestled against in the Olympic Games to which the apostle alludes. And the meaning is not with men only, yet they wrestle not against these only, but against principalities and against powers by whom are meant not civil magistrates or the Roman governors, though these are sometimes called, Titus 3.1, for example, and may be said to be the rulers of the darkness of this world, of the dark heathen world, and were in high places, and were of wicked and malicious spirits against the people of Christ. And the connection with the preceding verse shows the contrary, the enemy being the devil, and the armor spiritual. Wherefore, the devils are here designed, who are described from their power, rule, and government, both in this cause, in, in this clause, and the next, against the rulers of the darkness of the world. That is, over wicked men. Okay, I'll slow down here. Over the rulers of the darkness of this world, over wicked men in it, who are in a state of darkness itself. 
wicked men in high places of authority and power being manipulated by the powers of darkness. Are you getting this? This, the demonic world cannot function in a practical manner in the earth except as they do it through people. The enemy being the devil, the armor of spiritual, wherefore the devils are here designed who are described from their power, etc. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That is, over wicked men in it who are in a state of darkness. And so Satan is called the prince and God of this world, John 12, 31. The devil is called the prince of darkness. And mention is made of them of the darkness of the world, from whom the apostles seem to have taken these phrases who also use it of civil governors and render it as here, the rulers of the world, and say it signifies monarchs, such as rule from one end of the world to the other. Satan's evil empire manipulating Wicked men in high places to accomplish the evil machinations of Satan in the world. That's called a satanic conspiracy. If you don't understand that, you're never going to be effective in fighting this war. One last paragraph. Against spiritual wickedness in high places, John Gill writes, Wicked spirits, as the devils are, unclean, proud, lying, deceitful, malicious, who may be said to be in high or heavenly places, not in places super celestial, not in the highest heavens, in the third heaven where God, angels, and the saints are, but in the aerial heavens where the power or posse of devils reside. And where they are above us, over our heads, overlooking us, watching every advantage against us. And therefore, we should have on our armor and be in a readiness to engage them. Those were the days when men wrote real Bible commentaries. A couple of Old Testament Verses to help illustrate what we learned in Ephesians 6.12. First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1. First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel. Read it again. And Satan stood up against Israel. He stood against the nation. And provoked David to number Israel. In this particular instance, we're not even dealing with a wicked ruler. We're dealing with God's anointed, the man after God's own heart. We're not dealing with a Beelzebub. We're dealing with a saint. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. I preached a message on this at length. I talked about 
the international crime of aggression. That it is the worst crime that can be committed on an international level. It is the crime of aggression that God most despises in nations. God has laws for individuals. God has laws for nations. They are not always the same laws, although in principle many, if not most, are. But God has specific laws for nations. And the most egregious violation of the natural law of God for nations is the crime of aggression. I've got a message on that over on the table. If you haven't heard it, I hope you'll take it and watch it. The crime of aggression. It is a heinous crime against heaven. Satan attacked Israel, God's people in the Old Testament. How did he do this? He manipulated King David to prepare his army for the crime of aggression. God saw David's heart. He knew that's what David was preparing for. When he numbered the men, the only reason you number your men is to prepare them for war. It's the only reason. But God had not called David to war at this point in his life. This was not a just war that David was contemplating. It was his war. It wasn't a just war. God saw his heart. God saw what he was doing in preparation to commit the war of uh, the, the, the crime of aggression. Because of God's immense love for David and for Israel, God intervened himself in that process and stopped David before it started, but in the process, tens of thousands of David's men were killed by God as a judgment on what David was doing. If that doesn't speak to the seriousness of this crime in the mind of God, I don't know what would. God was willing to judge his servant, his anointed king. He was willing to bring judgment upon David's army and slay, if I remember right, 24,000 men. And they hadn't even started the unjust war yet. Imagine what God would have done to them had he allowed them to continue. Imagine the loss of life. Imagine the judgment. Unjust war is a curse upon a nation. It is a curse. Satan was behind that. Satan was in that planning room when the war council met in David's army. Satan was behind that. Another verse, Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing 
at his right hand to resist him. The forces of Satan are standing on this platform trying to confuse and to take the words of the messenger of God and twist it in the hearts and the minds of people even before they have an opportunity to apply it to their consciousness. Satan stands in opposition to every messenger of truth. He stands in opposition to every political leader who would attempt to promote truth in his nation or kingdom. The devil hasn't gone anywhere, folks. He's still alive and well. If the devil could manipulate King David in the war room, are you telling me that Satan cannot manipulate the president and the defense secretary of defense and the joint chiefs of staff and the other planners of war in the war rooms of America and Great Britain in the modern state of Israel and any other nation of the world? Are you telling me that Satan has gone on a 2,000 year vacation? He's still in those rooms. John 8, 44, listen to what Jesus said about Satan. Speaking to the Pharisees, he said, Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. And then he gives the two great attributes of Satan. Number one, he was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth. Because there's no truth in him. Number two, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The two chief character traits of Satan. He is a murderer and he's a liar or a deceiver. Everything he does is deception. Everything is a lie. The, re the intended result of this deception is murder and death. I said it not long ago. The devil is the great collector of souls. Because once he claims a soul, that soul never can leave his kingdom. That soul is Satan's captured slave for eternity. In the domains of the in the domain of the damned, Satan rules over the lost souls of men and women. He loves death. He promotes it in every way possible. He deceives men, setting them up for destruction and death. The great deceiver. Remember how Barnes talked about, and Gil too, the, the evil spirits in the air above us. There's a verse in the New Testament that I'm taking out of context, but I believe you'll appreciate this. There is a verse talking about that lame man that the four men cut the hole in the roof, remember, and laid brought the cot down so Jesus could heal him. The, the way the King James says it, the crowd 
around Jesus in the, in the building or near the building. And the King James says, and they could not come to Jesus because of the press. I think that's very accurate. A lot of people don't know truth. Jesus is the truth. They don't know truth because of the press. We're being lied to every day, 24-7, constant deception. Let me give you a story that you haven't heard. Let me give you a story that Katie Couric won't tell you about. Give you one that Bill O'Reilly will ignore, as will Sean Hannity. This is taken from Christian Today, written by Ruth Gledhill. The title of the article reads, Syrian Christian leader tells West, stop arming terror groups who are massacring our people. Let me read what they won't tell you. The world leader of Syria's besieged Christians has issued a heartfelt plea to the West to stop arming and supporting terrorist groups that are destroying our countries and massacring our people. The Patriarch of Antioch. Remember the city of Antioch? The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Syria. The Patriarch of Antioch, and I'm probably going to not do justice to the name, Moran Moore Ignatius Ephraim II said, he was not asking the West for military intervention to defend Christians. If the West wants to do something about the present crisis, the most effective thing would be to support local governments, which need sufficient armies and forces to maintain security and defend respective populations against attacks. State institutions need to be strengthened and established. Instead, what we see is their forced dismemberment being fueled from the outside. I hope you can stay awake through this one. Throughout its journey through history, the church has also been a suffering church, he added. Speaking in the days after meeting the Pope in Rome, he just returned from commissionally his hometown, I'm probably not doing justice to these names, where he met thousands of new Christian refugees who fled after Islamic State jihadists attacked Hasaki in Jazeera province. Along with bishops of his church, he recently had talks with President Assad of Syria. President Assad urged us to do everything in our hands to prevent Christians from leaving Syria. I know you are suffering, he said, but please don't leave this land which has been your home for thousands of years, even before Islam came. He said, Christians will also be needed when the time comes to rebuild this devastated country. And then the patriarch of Antioch says, the majority of Syrian citizens support Assad's government, and have always supported it. We recognize legitimate rulers and pray for them as the New Testament teaches us. We also see that the other side, there is no democratic opposition, only extremist groups. Above all, we see that in the past few years, these groups have been basing their actions on an ideology that comes from the outside. 
brought here by preachers of hatred who have come from and are backed by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Egypt. These groups receive arms through Turkey too. He said, the Islamic, the Islamic State, listen to this very carefully, all you Muslim haters out there. The Islamic State was not the Islam that Syrians have learned about and lived alongside for hundreds of years. Christians living side by side with Muslims in Syria for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You haven't been told that, have you? These are forces that fuel it with arms and money because it's useful. But all this also draw on a perverse religious ideology that claims to be inspired by the Quran. close quote. This is the Christian, the leader of the Christian church in Syria talking. Let me put this a little bit in perspective for you. Why all of this is happening this refugee crisis, these wars of aggression in the Middle East, and all the results that come thereby. Let me give you a little background. Something else you haven't heard from Fox News or CNN. I'm quoting from the researchers at globalresearch.com, a group out of Canada an international research group with a nonpartisan base with no political ax to grind. Let me, let me just read some of this. Young Muslims from Belgium, France, Denmark, Germany, Canada joined the Jihad in Somalia, Algeria, and Syria. They metamorphosed into terrorists in the name of a cause that will continue to motivate followers as long as it continues to appear legitimate and without alternative in their eyes. This cause is amplified by growing Islamophobia, discrimination, and marginalization of the Muslim community, especially the youth, and the persistence of the Palestinian drama. It is fueled by repeated military operations on Islamic soil, particularly drone strikes. The indiscriminate deaths of innocents raining down from the sky, leaving a seething wake of injustice and humiliation. The former head of the Pentagon's Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Michael Clinn, now admits that drones generate more terrorists than they kill. The extreme violence by the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, Isil, may seem less incomprehensible if we put it in the context of some hard revealing data. An estimated 600,000, 600,000 Iraqi civilians have been killed following the invasion and occupation of Iraq. 600,000 civilians. 500,000 children died between 1991 and 1998 as a result of sanction imposed against the regime of Saddam Hussein. 500,000 children. I remember Madeleine Albright, then Secretary of the State, being quizzed 
by a, con by a, a committee of Congress about these deaths of all these little children. And I forget the exact quote, but Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, basically said these are acceptable numbers. That's what, this, that's what she said. 500,000, a half million little innocent children dead because of the sanctions by the West. And the Madeleine Albright, without conscience, these are acceptable numbers. Quoting again, in Afghanistan since 2003, more than 250,000 civilians have been killed. A quarter million civilians killed in Afghanistan since we invaded. Not soldiers, civilians. Not terrorists, not Al-Qaeda, not ISIS, civilians, 250,000. Already we're up to nearly a million deaths with just the two statistics I've given you so far. More than 130,000 Afghans have been disabled mostly because of landmines, including 40,000 amputees among the civilian population. These figures are considerably underestimated. The number of Afghan children and Afghan women killed in the first half of 2015 increased by 13% and 23% respectively. 13 and 23% more women and children killed in the first half of this year than before. Just this year. There are an estimated 5 million orphans in Iraq. 2 million in Afghanistan where 20% of the children will not live to see their fifth birthday. On April 30th, 2015, in the Syrian village of Bermali, in the Aleppo government, on the east bank of the Euphrates, a village I found peaceful and hospitable in 1972 when I participated in an archaeological dig at the citadel of Aleppo. More than 50 civilians were killed by coalition bombs, including 31 children and 19 women. Just one instance. One instance. One attack. 50 civilians. 31 children, 19 women. The air wars and McClatchy have challenged the Pentagon over these blunders. We must also add the deaths of 18 civilians in Harem on November 5th, 50 in Al-Bab on December 28, 2014, 70 civilians in Halaja on June 2nd, in Kafir Hind on July 28, and 11 in Atma on August 11, with 2,449 air attacks in Syria between September 2014 and August 20, 2015, the, the only civilian deaths publicly acknowledged by the Pentagon CENTCOM on May 21, 2015, were those of two five-year-old girls. The U.S. admits to killing two five-year-old girls. 2,449 airstrikes in Syria. And we killed two girls. We've got an incompetent air force, that's for sure. If you can drop 2,500 bombs and only kill two people. Ridiculous. Quoting, the media consistently cloaked the responsibility of the West and its proxies for initiating and expanding wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and the Horn of Africa. 
What can we expect when children, the most precious part of our life, are killed or abused except more grief, more hatred, and more violence? What do you expect? How would you react if they were your children, your grandchildren, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your, your father, your mother? How would you react? Day after day after week after week after month after month after year after year, bombs, bombs, drones, attacks, non-stop violence against your loved ones. We also have a technique where we will go in and bomb either with air force sorties or with, with, with drones, a, a building where we think terrorists are, and we'll kill a whole bunch of people in the building, and then when all of the loved ones and relatives come out to try and, and rescue their loved ones, recover the ones that are wounded and, and the ones that have died in the rubble, then we'll send in another wave of attacks to kill the people that came to help. That's common. What do we expect? What can we hope to reap from fields sown with so much sorrow and despair? What alternative means of redress is offered to Gaza resident? Talk of Abu Jama, the only survivor of an Israeli bombing raid on July 20, 2014, that killed 26 members of his family, including his wife and his eight children. What do you expect? In 2014 alone, more than 1.2 million people were forced into refugee status. And the appalling figures continue in 2015. More than 4 million Syrian refugees. The 71 decomposing Syrian bodies found in a smuggler's abandoned truck in Austria and the drowned body of a three-year-old Alan Kurdi washed up on a turkey speech have shocked the West and should weigh heavily on its conscience given its fundamental role in their misfortune. But the media consistently cloak the responsibility of the West and its proxies for initiating and expanding wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and the Horn of Africa. The brutal violence ex exhibited now in Paris, Beirut, Aleppo, and elsewhere by combatants in the jihadi movement has grown from this heritage. Terrorism feeds off this violence. ISIL is a phenomenon that has its parallels with the emergence of the Khmer Rouge, originally a minority Maoist rebellion led by Pol Pot after the violation of national sovereignty in 1973 and U.S. bombing raids caused some 500,000 deaths. The Khmer Rouge transformed into an extremely violent movement responsible for the deaths of an estimated 2 million people between 1975 and 1979, a quarter of the country's population. Who is the real enemy? here. Satan. Satan is manipulating the war rooms of Washington, D.C. Satan is manipulating the war rooms of London. Satan is manipulating the war rooms of Tel Aviv. Satan is, is manipulating the war rooms in Saudi Arabia and Turkey. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, Muslim or otherwise. Amen. 
What would we do if it happened here? Do you really think that Turkish government shot down two Russian military pieces of equipment, a fighter jet, and then later a helicopter, shooting a parachuting pilot as he ejected from the cockpit? Do you really, truly think Turkey did that on its own? Turkey is a NATO member. The United States of America controls NATO. NATO countries do not blow their nose without the permission of the United States government. U.S. intelligence sent Turkey the flight path of that Russian jet. Before that, a Russian passenger, civilian passenger plane, was shot out of the sky. Three Russian planes have been shot out of the sky, violating no airspace of a foreign territory. That jet was in Syrian airspace, not Turkish. I'll tell you why. You should already know the reason why. If Vladimir Putin and his Russian forces are inflicting serious, serious damage against ISIS, we have only been pretending to fight ISIS. Russia is really doing it. And guess what? Where does ISIS get all of its money? From the oil wells that it produces and sends to Turkey. And then from Turkey to Tel Aviv. And from there who knows where else? Selling oil at about 19 to 20 cents a gallon. Excuse me, 19 or 20 dollars a barrel. 19 or 20 dollars a barrel. One of the reasons that our gas prices are so low and at the pump they ought to be even lower than they are. We're talking hovering around $40 a barrel here in the United States. Over the next couple of weeks you watch it's going to dip into the $30 range. That should put the gas at the pump at somewhere maybe around a dollar a gallon. That's another story. <laughs> Why is it? Why is that? One of the reasons is because of all the cheap oil they're buying from ISIS. America doesn't want to stop ISIS. Turkey's oil supply from ISIS is at risk. Israel's oil supply from ISIS is at risk. Turkey's mad. Washington, D.C. is mad. Tel Aviv is mad. They're mad at Vladimir Putin. They're mad at Russia. And so they shoot down three aircraft. What would we do if those were U.S. aircraft? But no U.S. aircraft are even shot at. Why? Because we're not doing anything to hurt ISIS. We're no threat. Who's the real enemy? 
Say it. Satan. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If every pastor in America, if every evangelical Bible-believing pastor in America had the sense, the knowledge, and the guts to stand up and tell their congregations, what well, I'm telling you right now, all this war of aggression and this war fever and all this stuff that's going on in the Middle East would stop. The people would recognize the truth and they would see the real enemy and they would stand for what was right and this whole facade would come crashing down like a House of cards. But we're not told this. We're not told this. You'll see some selective video of writing Muslims in Europe patched together. That's that's filmed over many, many months or years and then pieced together in a 30-minute clip representing all Muslims in that light. Sharia law is coming. I could take a film crew every weekend for the next six months in downtown Chicago, Illinois and Los Angeles, California. And I could put together video equally disturbing as the videos you're seeing on the internet about the Muslims in Europe. Why don't we hear about the beheadings of MS-13 on both sides of the American, uh, the American border, Mexican-U.S. border? For every one beheading that is committed by a Muslim jihadist, there will be 10, and I'm just using that, it's not a scientific number, but there will be 10 beheadings by a Mexican gang, a Mexican drug gang. Beheading has been the favored tactic of terrorism by the, by the drug gangs of Mexico and Central America for decades. Why do we see no beheadings on NBC and CBS of the MS-13 gangs beheading their victims? Why don't we ever see those? What, one beheading is worse than another beheading? One life is more, worth more than another life? What about all these people that are being killed by the Mexican gangs coming across the border? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of beheadings have been going on for decades and decades. And you haven't seen the first one on national television. Beyond that, there's no question that some of the so-called beheadings that we've seen on the news are staged events and they're not even real. They're just staged for media. Not all of them, but some of them. The point is, who's the enemy? Who is the enemy? As long as you're, you think the Syrian refugees are the enemy, you're not, you're not in a position to even fight this battle. Right. Yep. Right. Am I suggesting that, that, there, that there are not violent Muslim jihadists? Of course not. Of course there are. Some of them have been planted by Western operatives in Saudi Arabia and the United States and Israel and they're not real Muslims. They are Muslim agitators. 
That's a fact. Not all of those one, all of those jihadists you're looking at who are called Allah Akbar, not all of them are true Muslims. Many of them are plants. Provocateurs who are paid to incite violence. Some of them are real. They've lost their sons and daughters and their moms and dads and their brothers and sisters. They've, lost, they've seen everyone that was dear to them blown up. And they're mad. What would we do? Until we realize that we have leaders in our country and in the West that are being manipulated by the wicked one, the evil one, who are using the politics and the violence of nations for their own nefarious purposes, until we realize that we are fighting a satanic conspiracy, we will be totally ineffectual in fighting this war. We will fight any enemy that tries to hurt us on our soil. I think I could be able to get an amen on that. Amen. We will fight any enemy that tries to harm us on our soil. I don't care what their race, what their ethnicity, what their religion, what the color of their skin. We will defend our families, our homes, our lives, our communities. Does anyone here think for one second that we're not going to defend ourselves? I think with the way that our foreign policy is and the way that our immigration policy is in Washington, it's, it, it, come on, you, you have to know that Washington is not serious about fighting a war on terror when they leave our southern border wide open for any terrorist to walk over almost at will. Do you really think we're serious about fighting a war on terror? We will defend ourselves. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about the Flathead Valley not defending itself. Are you worried about that? Anybody here worried about that? They had another shooting in Colorado Springs, gun control mecca. I said something on my Facebook post about, you know, come on. You don't see these things happening in Montana. I had a guy write back and said, oh, Chuck, it, it just because it hadn't happened don't mean that it, it can't happen. There's, there's no difference in Montana or any other place. This is it. it could happen anywhere. Guns are the problem. We're not getting rid of everybody. Gonna... And I responded back. I just said, come to Montana and try it. <laughs> and I guess I can't speak for every nook and cranny. I can't. I don't know if I can speak for every part of Missoula. <laughs> but I can pretty well speak for the Flathead Valley, and I'll say it again. Come and try it. This is a state, this is an area where people believe in the right to keep and bear arms, and they do it. Yeah. 
You know what, the, the biggest problem we have crime-wise is mostly car break-ins. Somebody sees something in a car, they break a window, and they, they grab it. That's, that's the, mostly what we have around here. We, we don't even have too many, we don't even have too many burglaries. Well, why not? Well, duh. The bad guys grew up here. They know that the average home in Montana has 27 guns in it. And all it takes is one. I'm, I'm not really, I'm not worried about the Flathead Valley defending itself from whoever the enemy is. But what we ought to be very concerned about is a satanic, manipulated yes. government. Yes. That creates, that creates the climate of violence and fear and anger and hatred. People against people. Nation against nation, race against race. Therefore, we are told to take the whole armor of God. And notice what that armor involves. Six things. What's the first one? Verses 13 through 17. What's the first one? Having your loins girt about with what? Truth. First one is truth. Quit listening to the lies. Quit being a willing participant of, de of deception and be a seeker of truth. That's their first line of defense, yes. is to know the truth. Amen. That's the first line of defense. Amen. Know the truth. Amen. To do that, you're going to have to do some independent study. You're going to have to turn off Fox News, CNN, Quit reading the establishment media, and you're going to have to do some digging. And even when you start doing some independent digging, you're going to have to be aware of many of the alternative news sources are also filled with deception. And you're going to have to wade through all that. But truth is our first line of defense, the first part of the armor. Secondly, righteousness. Not the righteousness like the scribes and Pharisees have, a facade, a pretenseful righteousness. I go to church. I don't do this. I don't do that. I'm good. <laughs> Did you like that? <laughs> I'm good. Not that kind of righteousness. The righteousness that only comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. The righteousness that recognizes that I am a sinner undone before God and I can only be made righteous in the robes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That righteousness. Yes. And then what's the next one? The gospel of what? Peace. Peace. How did the church become so hateful? How did we become such a warmongering people? How did that happen to us? The gospel of peace. The gospel is peace. 
I give unto you my peace, Jesus said. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You can't have the spirit of fear and the spirit of peace at the same time. Can't. If you're consumed with the spirit of fear, which so many of our Christian friends are, they have not the spirit of fear. That's why they're warmongers. What's the difference between us filled with rage and anger and fear over what somebody might do to us and those on the other side who are filled with hatred and fear and anger about what has been done unto them. What's the difference? How are we going to convert them if we are guilty of the same hatred that they are? doesn't mean that we don't defend ourselves. Of course we do. I don't have to rehash that, do I? But it's a gospel of peace. Those missionaries that I know over there in that region of the world, they're taking the gospel of peace to those Muslims. And they're seeing hundreds of them converted to Jesus Christ. Hundreds of them. Listen, think these... Many of these Muslims over there that have lived peacefully side by side with Christians and others in that region of the world. Think about it. The Christian history of Syria goes back to the book of Acts. The Christian history of Syria goes back to the book of Acts. A long time before the United States of America was even thought of. And now they're seeing the destruction upon their people and they're watching their friends turn into savage madmen inflicting most carnage upon their fellow Muslim. Most of the people that are killed are Muslims. Their minds are not absorbing this. Their minds are confused. They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand the way the West is behaving, the so-called Christian West. They don't understand the way the, 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 the terrorists are, are behaving. You remember the video we showed you of that elderly Muslim lady who stood eyeball to eyeball with an ISIS fighter and told him to stop it? Amen. You remember that? We need to show that again. They're confused. They're troubled. Our missionaries are going in with the gospel of peace. They're giving them the truth that Jesus loved them that he died for them as much as he died for anybody in the West, that we're all one in Christ, that we all come to Jesus the same way, that we all come to God through Christ, the love of God, the peace of God that brings harmony, and because of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, nothing divides us. Race doesn't divide us. Nationhood doesn't divide us. Ethnicity doesn't divide us. In heaven, there isn't going to be a white compartment and a black compartment and a Hispanic compartment and an Indian compartment. There's just one heaven for all people. There's not going to be a Baptist section and a Presbyterian section and a Catholic section. There's one heaven, one Christ, one Lord, one faith. That's the message of peace that the gospel brings to the world. 
Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. The devil is the Prince of Darkness. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. They're giving the gospel of peace to these people. And many, many, many of them are coming to the Lord. You're not going to convert Muslims with bombs and drones. But that's not the purpose of that anyway, is it? What's the next one? Faith. Faith. Not hopelessness, not futility, faith, faith. There is a future, and the future is positive. It's not negative. Faith, by faith, we live. By faith, we walk. By faith, we work. By faith, we fight. What's the next one? Salvation. Ah. Are you saved? Are you saved? Do you know the joy of receiving Christ as Savior? The peace that passes all understanding? The forgiveness of sin? The home in heaven? The hope of eternal life? Are you saved? Ah. Salvation. If you don't have that, you don't have the armor of God. And then the last one, the word of God. The word of God. Comparing scripture with scripture. Taking truth here first. Reconciling the events around us and the words that we hear by this barometer. We don't judge this by that. We judge that by this. And you'll find that this book is right up to date. And you're not going to confront a problem that's not covered in this book. Amen. You're not going to face an enemy. You're not going to face a challenge that's not covered in this book. That's the armor of God. Amen. So as we go forward into this battle, we have to do so with the knowledge of who the real enemy is. We have to do so understanding the satanic conspiracy behind so many of these events. We have to do so by putting on the whole armor of God and being able then as true Christian soldiers to go onward and forward. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And when God's people understand the truth they understand the enemy when they put on the armor of God and they march forward accordingly. As Jesus said in Matthew 16, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Thank you. Let's stand for a word of prayer.